Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30-day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From hanselminutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 566. In this episode, Scott talks with Lairon Walker about the current state of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math learning. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Lairon Walker. He's a technology entrepreneur and an Atlanta native. He's got some amazing stuff uh, he's working on right now around STEM. How are you, sir? Doing well. How about yourself, Scott? I'm pretty excited to be talking to you. I'm feeling good. Uh, my, uh, my eight year old, actually he's nine now, uh, and I, you know, are do a lot of, you know, kind of STEM and STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math type stuff. Yesterday he asked that he wanted a, uh, an Alexa, like an echo in his, in his room. Okay. And I tried, like, why do you want this? Why, why do you need this in your life? Uh, and it's because he wanted to play music. So hmm. I didn't want to, I didn't want to give him that. I feel that it's too, it's too immediate. There's, they're too late. It's, there's a laziness factor there. You know, they want the sum total of all human knowledge available <laughs> like that. Uh, so I said, if you want a radio like that in your room, then you have to build it. So then we went off and we've got a Raspberry Pi. We went to Goodwill. We built, we built a little streaming internet radio. You know, there I you wanted, go. To, I wanted to make it, you know, more real. And I know that's something that you really care about. Yeah, man, that's a big part of what we do, man. Because just like yourself, um, I guess I was like your son years ago. And um, so I went down the path of engineering school and becoming an electrical engineer, both in undergraduate and graduate school. But one of the things I realized when I got farther along is that a lot of my peers, they they came in ready to go. And if you look at their experiences, a lot of those guys or, or girls, they had access to things when they were growing up. And when you look at that, a lot of kids now don't get that exposure. So in our companies, what we focus on is – how do you find a way to make sure that education is engaged and accessible and affordable? And so we spend a lot of our time creating tool sets to make that possible. And so like in our 3D printing business, it's just like your son. We have a company um, called MyStemKits.com. And with that particular business, we realized that the 3D printer is an amazing tool that is being severely underutilized in schools. And so we went out and created um, a library of over 140 different things that you can 3D print, um, plug and play, um, that were aligned to the education standards, but let people like your your son get access to tools and manipulatives that they can use that were aligned to their what they were doing in school, but also fun and engaging. And so that's a really big part of what we do. And it's it's, it's good to hear that story and what you're doing with your son at home because a lot of parents don't have that ability to make that happen, and the ones that do want to make it happen don't have access to resources to do that. Yeah, and I think that that, that that that's really that's really the essence of what we want to talk about today because I've I've. My, my son goes to a local public school. It's a charter school. Um, and when we go in there, you know, they, they'll get a, uh, they'll get a grant. Someone will give them a 3D printer or they'll get a grant and they'll get a box of Arduinos mm -hmm. and they'll, you know, they'll poke at it for a while. But I don't really feel like the teachers have the resources to understand why this is, why this is useful. Like they'll spend a day, they'll get the LED to blink. Mm -hmm. That's and it. then it just sits in the corner. And frankly, the 3D printer until I, until I, you know, kind of came along and uh, wanted to start acting, being more practical, it's just kind of been sitting there. Yeah. And not only that, um, like you said, they, they want to get engaged. But as an example, we're doing some work down in Florida now where we're combining some of the work with 3D printing in addition to the work that we're doing with sensors where a lot of times the science teachers are the ones responsible for teaching, computing and things along those lines. And they're not very motivated with going out to, like in my case last week, I was looking at trying to do some things with an Adreno. So I went out and I think I got like a spark fun kit, right? And I played with it. Mm -hmm. All those particular lessons are focused very heavily on how do you program with an Adreno. None of those lessons are telling a science or a math teacher how programming this Adreno is going to help your kid learn what their most important mission is or most important goals are. 
And so being able to take those lessons and build out solutions that are focused on the standard, which is what the teacher wants to teach, helps them really embrace that. So as an example, this summer, one of the projects that we're pushing out is it's a series of lessons that take hardware, IoT devices that we create, 3D printable kits, and we're going through an entire set of lessons that start from the math and science um, and computer science standards. We're teaching kids how to program scratch, um, focused on the standard itself. And by the way, it just happens to include computing with it as well. And so that will allow for that science teacher to get behind it, expose it, not be intimidated by it, but also get that kid to play with devices and hardware, which is what they want to do as well. So trying to close that ecosystem, um, I think will really help solve some of the problems that you're seeing in, in your own scenario. Yeah, I mean, it's asking a lot of a teacher to learn how to do deal with a 3D printer mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, be be creative uh, and come up with the bridge between whatever they're teaching, whatever standard that they're teaching, mm -hmm. and what they can, you know, imagine that they could create. You know, I don't want this to be an advertisement for my STEM kits, but I will sure. tell you that the reason that I reached out to you to do the podcast is that I saw your, on your Twitter account. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. recommend that people who are listening to the show go check it out. It's my STEM kits and go to the, the photos section. Um, like I'll give you like an example, right? Like we all did like potential energy and kinetic energy, like in school, you know, and it's usually like, um, you know, uh, taking a, a Hot Wheels car down a ramp, you know what I mean? And then there's value in that, but you know, you created like an energy roller coaster kit, yep. at, with a very specific curve to show how energy moves from place to place. And you print everything out from scratch, uh, the, the 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 creativity in the 3D printing stuff and the imagination there is what you're kind of like what you're paying for. I don't know who you got to do that, but <laughs> it's amazing. It's, this is hundreds and hundreds of kits that I wish I had in school when I was uh, coming up. And that's what's fun about it as well. In that particular um, initiative, also we work a lot with some creative people down at Florida State University, where there's an entire team of just educators and teachers and master teachers that have taught in the classroom. So every mm -hmm. kit you see out there, not only was it Created to, you know, allow for that experience to be simple for a teacher to use the printer. They also were, they've been tested and used in the classroom. So every kid has gone through multiple iterations. Um, so by the time it gets to our portal, they've been used. And for each particular, each kit that's out there, we have one or more lessons assigned to it. So if you're a fifth grade teacher who wants to teach that potential energy scenario, you could go and just go to the math section and say, give me a five, a grade five example. And it will show you lesson. It will show you standards, um, aligned curriculum that you can use. And the idea for this is very simple is how can you create the biggest and mo most robust library, um, of STEM aligned manipulatives that can be used, um, that are relevant. And in some cases, the value proposition just in there is that, and we have examples as an example where a lot of, um, anatomy type classes or things along those lines of biology lessons, they have bird skulls and things. And I always tell people the thing that like, if you wanted to go and do something in your classroom with a skull, a bird has to die, right? So mm -hmm. those things are very expensive. So, or in some cases, maybe it's an example on anatomy where it's a small species. So like a pigeon skull or something, and you don't want a kindergarten working with that small, fragile thing. And so in a lot of cases, we have kits that we've created that can't necessarily be purchased or bought. So, they can, they're very expensive to produce. But in other cases, there are things that you just can't manufacture a mold. And so it opens up the, the possibilities there. Um, and the third thing that we do there is that a lot of times 3D printing is not as, a lot of people assume that 3D printing really is about just scanning a picture and printing something out. And that experience of designing a model, you know, putting it on an SD card, popping it into a computer and printing it becomes very kind of cumbersome. And so in our use case, what we've done is that we built out a platform to where you can onboard um, pretty much any major printer in the market and directly stream to the printer. So within a classroom, a teacher can log in, browse a collection of files they want, segment it by standard and grade, and hit the print button. And when they do that, it literally starts to stream to the printer. And so making demystifying that 3D printing experience but making it relevant has been a big part of our focus. Um, and we, we're getting got a lot of good reception around that. And we're hopeful that with this current approach, we can reach more kids. And, and again, back to the model before of making it engaged and accessible and affordable so that anybody who has this can kind of get engaged. That's a really big part of my passion and mission these days. 
Yeah, th- that that aspect of things is so important because you, when as a 3D printer person myself, I would have to say that probably 60% of my time is thinking about how to get the thing to print the thing, you know, yeah. like laying it out on the, on the, you know, you, you, you get the model, someone hands you the model and typically it's, it's public domain. It's a model mm-hmm. that you find on Thingiverse. Yep. You have to place it on the, on the, um, on the print surface, orient it appropriately, set up the supports correctly. Um, you have to think, like imagine if someone gave you a Word document and you had to figure out the right size, the right margins, the right fonts. None of that was included. That's all barriers to prevent me or a teacher from from just success. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and so in our case, you mentioned who does that. So Hannah Olson is the people going. They go and look at Twitter. They'll see Hannah out there, and she I call her the STEM goddess. Like she is an amazing person. Um, and her particular case has a background in modeling. Went to school for doing that. And so having that type of person on our team that's able to go through and guide our team of, of modelers to build these things out. And not, a, not just assemble it, as you mentioned, but setting specific settings per printer. So in some cases, as an example, we always show, we have an example of a kit, which is a density cubes kit. And it's nice because of 3D printing, one of the things that you can control is the density of the, the shape you're presenting, that you're making. And so you build out these density cubes with different densities and you can drop them in a, a pool of water. And so showing a kid that, you know, things that are more dense will sink and things that don't will rise is, is critical. We also have scenarios of this teeter-totter, and I use this on my kids. You mentioned you have a, a young son. So I have seven-year-old twins, a boy and girl, and they always say things like, um, you know, it's a thousand percent. So they understand magnitude, but not really kind of, you know, what it really means, like a hundred versus a million. They don't really know the difference. So one of the kids mm-hmm. that we have is a is a, a weighted scale. So you print this scale out. And you can print out these um, little squares of different densities. And the squares can be things like, um, let's say, coins is one example. So there's a dollar piece, a nickel piece, a dime piece. Mm -hmm. And as you stack them on the scale, it balances itself. So I was able to take that particular kit home for dinner one day and just give my kids these things. And I didn't even explain what I was doing. And by the time we finished dinner, they knew that four quarters equal one dollar. And they were able to make those kind of determinations just by simply playing with with plastics, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've been trying forever figuring out forever how to explain that and I couldn't. And so these kits enable things like that. And so it's exciting when you get in the classroom, you see a kid at a conference playing with it or in a classroom playing with it. And you can see how, man, this printer, which was simply before just a random thing now has, has become a supply factory that really can, can can change people's perceptions on education. So let's, let's back up and parse a word that, that you've been throwing around. Like it's obvious because this is your business. Sure. You said manipulatives. Yep. What a manipulative, that makes me feel like it's, it's the stuff that you touch and feel, and that's when, when the learning happens. Yeah, manipulative would be an, an asset or an object that you're using in a classroom to aid an in instruction. So um, a ruler, right? If you're teaching how to measure length and precision, the ruler itself would be the manipulative. Um, and so in our case, um, if you look through the My STEM Kits um, portfolio of projects, uh, we're building things like catapults, rocket launchers, DNA kits, the scales, we're building cars. So all of these are assets that um, a teacher typically, as you mentioned, will be doing in the classroom. So you mentioned the potential energy scenario. Let's mm-hmm. walk through that example. When I was in school, you had this sign, you so, this sign wave type of thing. And it was like, when you're at the top, you're at your highest potential. When you rise to the bottom, you lost potential. And you're trying to explain this abstract concept. And let's fast forward that back to how my STEM kids would approach that. Um, we realized that in most classrooms that when they're trying to buy ramp kits, they're very expensive. On average, schools are spending $150, $200 plus to go out and buy a kit just to do one particular experiment. So in our case, we said, well, great, let's go and design a ramp kit where we're going to use pencils and rulers. So we produced the 3D printed parts um, that you print out and you combine these with the pencils and rulers to make a ramp, i.e. your manipulative. And now you're trying to teach kids, well, potential and kinetic energy. So what we do is we have a car. And then one of our partners is a um, company called Hip Science, which manufactures sensors. So we take this car and we put a force and motion sensor on it. So this is an IoT Bluetooth device where you can put it on the cart, run an experiment, and in real time via um, an app, you're able to collect data. The data includes the position, the velocity, acceleration. And then depending upon where you are, whether you're a younger kid or an older kid, you can take real-time data and, t- and be able to explain that phenomenon. So instead of going and drawing a graph and chart and trying to make this abstract notion catch with a kid who maybe is not interested, they're out in a classroom 
using real using their hands with these manipulatives to get that concept. And I think that that's the difference that it, taking these abstract concepts, making them very hands on and engaging, I think is what modif- motivates this these um, this challenge generation of learners. Mm-hmm. And I think that the one of the root things I'm hearing when when we talk about next generation STEM is also that the technology may be in the room. Mm-hmm. It may just be in different sections of the room. The Arduino or the sensor, the IoT device that they were given is in a drawer somewhere, unused. You know, the 3D printer uh, was fun for a week or two. We couldn't figure out what to print. We couldn't get it to print, so it's in the corner, unused. Uh, you know, or everyone has a, a, an iPhone or a, an Android phone, but, you know, other than some apps, what are we using for it? Uh, another great example is that you made a microscope phone adapter. There you go, yeah. Right. So you've got a microscope in the, in the classroom. Everyone's got an iPhone. Um, and with some rubber bands and some really clever 3D printed parts that are all part of this, this kit. Now you've, you've basically jacked your iPhone into the microscope and now you're taking video of what's happening on cells on the, uh, you know, live right there. But you, but you're not doing it with an expensive adapter or something that you bought that's just for that skill, right? You printed that plastic out yourself. And I think people take that for granted. What most people don't realize is that um, unless you have an educator in your family, is that a lot of those things you're mentioning are they're part of your supply budget. And oftentimes the teacher is the person out making those things happen. They're the one running around the Hobby Lobby and different places trying to buy stuff to do things. Right. And so um, being able to have that resource available, but it goes a step farther. How do you know how to sequence that and they can find it when they need it? And I think a lot of people kind of get confused in this internet age and where we're so used to going out and typing into our nearest browser, our nearest search engine, a keyword and finding a result. Um, but there's a lot of mess out there and a lot of stuff that's, that's available. And so being able to filter and index these different tools, present them back when they're needed, and then making it easy for those teachers to produce and get access to it is also a part of that. And the other piece that is important as well is the professional development. Because as you mentioned, I was in a school last week here in Atlanta. Um, and it was with a local STEM coordinator. And I walked into the room and I saw every robot you can imagine, every piece of hardware you can imagine. And every, it was, it was crazy. It, it must have been in that room, smart boards. And it probably was $300,000 of stuff in that room. But that, but I was there showing our solution and what it did and they saw value in it. And almost to the point to where we, we asked the question and we talked about how a lot of times different schools and people just buy stuff because it was in a, in a, in a catalog somewhere and the teacher raised her hand and said, I'm guilty of that. They're buying what they're being presented by people who market it best, but nobody's making it integrated so that people can really use it and add value. And that's a really big problem in the industry right now, and particularly in education. Yeah, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm surprised like that those schools exist, right? Like for every school that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of stuff like that, uh, there's other schools and that, like mine that are, that are, we're on, you know, 70% of the local budget and yeah. we're, you know, run by volunteers. Yeah. Yes, I have, uh, I have not. And I used to think as well, I, I used to think, so to me, it, it comes in two folds. We, and that's a real part of what we focus on as well is that in one sense, it's like the have nots who don't have access to resources, but on the other side is the people who have resources, but they're underexposed. And so being able to pull these things together in a coherent way that they understand and making a technology seamless um, is also a big piece of what it's going to take to be able to get this stuff out there in the masses so the kids truly can benefit. Mm-hmm. One other thing that's that, that I've found from a creativity perspective that is really impressive about the design of the different 3D things that you're doing helped me be a better 3D printer was, mm-hmm. and this is going to sound obvious, but the reminder that the thing that you're building doesn't just have to be made out of 3D printed parts. Yeah. Like, for example, a catapult. Yeah. If you try to build that with only stuff you can print, you're going to hit a wall really quickly. Mm-hmm. And it, while it might seem obvious to you to like add rubber bands or add a, a coin or some ball bearings or whatever, uh, it took me probably six months of 3D printing before I realized that I could go and just take some screws from Home Depot exactly. and screw them into the thing. And then things got interesting. And that was the whole point, though. The entire point of my STEM kits was leveraging stuff in the classroom to enable more stuff, right? So we built out we have an example of this like science experimenters kit. It does things like, um, you know, you have, you've seen a setup where you have like the, the light flashing, you're measuring temperature over distance and you have three or four different test tubes where you're measuring different liquids like those apparatus. Again, you may go and spend in a science, uh, typical science catalog, you know, a thousand dollars. 
And so you take five rulers, a couple of pencils and some common stuff, and you have this thing done with five dollars in plastics. And so that's a really so having teachers in the classroom knowing what they have access to and thinking about how you can take that and make it something greater, like if some of the parts is truly, you know, a big hole is, what, is, is a big focus of what we're doing there. So people get very excited by that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a, I want I have a Dremel uh, yeah, we, brand printer. We, I found that to be a real workhorse. Like we, I've got a couple other 3D printers, but the Dremel just works. No, we love Dremel. Actually, um, that's one of our strategic partners. So Dremel currently, when you purchase their education, um, skewed printer, it actually comes bundled with 10 of the My STEM kits, um, um, kits directly on the SD card. And we're soon to roll out a new printer. Um, there'll be an education skewed focus printer to where when you get that particular printer, it'll come bundled with four months of my STEM kits. So we, we like Dremel and we focus in on those guys. One, because of quality, it works. It works very well. Two, um, for the class and for the size of printer they have, it's actually one of the best values you'll find in the market. And so we really wanted to find something that you could go into a school that was enclosed that just works. And more importantly, if there's an issue, you can call 1-800-GIVE-ME-HELP and somebody answers the phone. So we, we like those guys and they're, they're one of our procedure partners. Yeah, I actually, funny, this is a true story. And again, like we're, we're sounding like we're gushing, but we are because when you find a good product, you gush a little bit, you know. I got the Dremel and then one day... Um, I stepped away from a little while and it got, it got kind of crooked because it, um, it got, got a clog. Mm -hmm. So I called support and, you know, I had low expectations of support. You know <laughs> what I mean? I have, I generally have low expectations. Uh, and I could hear something in the background. The, the, the person on the support was printing. Interesting. So <laughs> I just figured it would be somebody reading from a script, right? Uh, but the individual not only was printing, but actually knew the number of thousands of hours that they had in printing experience. So he's like, Oh no, I've been printing for like 1850 hours. <laughs> so this, this person helped me disassemble the head of the, of the Dremel and unclog it and then reassemble it. And it was not nearly as hard as I thought, but it was such a joy to talk to someone on support that actually was using the product, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of cool. And that's really important for education, man, because people will be surprised for some of the leaders in the market. The model in the past has been when, when schools buy printers, they don't even come with support. Support is like an add on. And more, and even some of the major printers that were, that were being sold to schools, man, they, they were out of the box in some cases have like, you know, 30, 40% failure rates. And so what happens in that case is that even with a, a, a product like ours, which we believe kind of enables an entire wave of innovation, people start to get this disdain on the industry. And so it's, it's holding, you know, holding back innovation. So yeah, definitely we're excited about those guys. And we hope that in our case that we can continue to add content over time. As an example, we pushed out. I think this past month alone, we pushed out an additional 40 kits and there are another 30 or 40 in the backlog. And outside of that curriculum is being written every day. So we, we hope that if you are out there now and you think the library is amazing, you know, just continue to check and it'll continue to grow and grow and add more value over time. So we've gushed about 3D printers mm -hmm. and you touched a little bit on sensors, but sure. I know that that we both feel that there's a lot of hardware that is in drawers. There's a lot yes. of Arduinos that have had LEDs blink and then they've been put away. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we go from the uh, the abstract to the, you know, the, the kinesthetic to the physical and, may, and put these things to work? And that, Yeah, we start in that, again, my, my background is electrical engineering and, uh, you know, being hands-on in the lab, like your son with that example of things blinking has always been intriguing to me. And so we focus on that as well. So if you take a look at um, mantisopenstem.com, mantis like the spider, O-P-E-N-S-T-E-M.com, there you'll see um, one of our strategic partners we work with. And the idea here was that how do you create an ecosystem of, um, again, open, engaged, and accessible sensors that allow for people to get engaged? So out there as an example, one of the My STEM Kits kits is imagine you're trying to teach kids um, – about light intensity, right? So there's a My STEM Kits kit that uses pencils and rulers to build this temperature tower. And what happens is that on the temperature tower, they mount one of the sensors, which is a climate sensor. And the sensor is able to measure things like temperature, light intensity, humidity, barometric pressure, et cetera. And they're all wireless sensors. So in one example, the kid has a cell phone. Again, like you said earlier, that's already in the classroom. They have mm -hmm. a piece of paper and they shine light from the cell phone through the paper. And what we do is that you change out that, that material and you're able to show kids in real time through an app that different um, surfaces have different intensities or they reflect different amounts of light. And so, again, taking common classroom things, bringing the IoT space into it and making it open and engaging is, is interesting there. We also, um, 
one of the projects I'm very excited about right now is that um, you're familiar with Scratch, I'm assuming, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, my son is working on a Scratch game right now. Perfect. It's pretty abstract, though. It's all just on the screen. Exactly. So, huge ecosystem. Like, the guys at MIT and that that ecosystem is very nice. And a lot of people of late have come out and started to put in sensors that tie into it. Um, So, you know, Legos, you name it. You can go in and connect with those things. The Mm -hmm. challenge is that, though... In most cases, all you're doing is going in, connecting and saying, go forward or go back. It's not really, again, tied to education. So one of the projects that we're doing today in that is that we're launching a version of Scratch, um, which is based on the current framework, where it will actually be able to co- connect to each of the sensors that are in the framework, but not just one-on-one actual at the same time, but we're building out with our partnership at FSU curriculum. And that curriculum is tied, focused on the fourth to the kind of eighth grade middle school kind of group. And it'll teach you Scratch. It'll teach you computer science and also teach you the standards. But it'll use Scratch as an interface to make that happen. Um, and so and then beyond that, for people who are in high school and beyond, those same sensors then also have open APIs where kids are learning how to do things like Unity. So I've been I don't play games a lot, but I'm very intrigued by gaming. And so we have interns here in the office now where they're writing apps that are leveraging and taking Bluetooth and IoT data and using things like Unity to write to write apps. So how do you meet people where they are and take them where they want to go? So if a person is an Android developer and here's a Java Java SDK or if somebody likes to write in Microsoft, here's what you need to go and make a Windows Universal app. But everything in that space needs to be, again, aligned back to the standards so these teachers and schools can embrace that. And, and that's a, a really big focus of what we're doing. It seems like having the you know these open standards and have it be kind of late the new IoT Lego pieces. Yeah. I always love to use Legos as that analogy, exactly. right? I think so, you yeah. don't want to be locked into a platform. You, you want to be able to talk to things over Bluetooth, over USB in a way that is uh, interchangeable. Yeah, yeah. So that I think that's critical. Most of the devices out there now in the IoT space um, in, in the classrooms are typically. They're not Bluetooth, or they're legacy Bluetooth or proprietary frameworks. Um, you can see a wave of new devices that are starting to come on come online now. Um, but a lot of people are really haven't been giving schools the access. So as an example, one of the major what they call pro companies in the market today, I was working with a school a couple of years ago. And when you bought their product, if you wanted to go in their app, as an example, and put your own curriculum in it, you had to pay them for that. And they would literally give you a PowerPoint file and you had to go and change a few words out. And they would basically take that curriculum put it inside of their app, and that's how you got exposed to it. And so you're really locked into it. And there were no APIs to get your data. You couldn't extend it. So what they did, they have a very nice sensor that can give you some data. The kid has an app in their hand. They can see the value change, and they can hit save. But since there wasn't an open standard, you couldn't take the temperature sensor and the climate sensor and go combine it in your own app to go make something for hydroponics. So you limited the use case based on what they wanted to expose because they didn't want their, their ecosystem was very closed. And I think that's a, a really big problem that's really stunting innovation um, and allow people to kind of go where they want to go with it. And so making it open, accessible, engaging, and thirdly, taking the cost out of it. Uh, there is no reason why it should cost somebody, you know, a hundred dollars to buy a temperature probe. That's not even digital. And, and that's that, that's a really big pain point for me as well. How do you, you're an entrepreneur though. You mm-hmm. presumably want to make business. How do you make things open and then also make money? I think it's very simple, man. So I, I, I always think about, and you would relate to this, like you think about domain names back in the day, right? Uh, you had to go to somewhere like register.com and buy a domain name and it was very expensive. And then this GoDaddy company comes along and kind of cuts the cost and everybody uses them, right? So I think that if you find a way to spread it out to the masses, there's a way to kind of make that happen. Because particularly if you look at hardware, one of the driving costs for hardware is the, is the scale at which you produce it, Right. And so finding ways to extend the use cases um, and to broaden the ecosystem helps you kind of keep those costs down. Um, and also, there are a lot of other value-added things that come with that. So, for instance, if you look at schools today, a lot of schools or states have adopted laws now um, where schools are moving away from dig- from actual physical textbooks. And so they're moving toward digital. Some schools, there's some open standards, textbook standards where you can produce digital textbooks. So some school districts actually go out and they compile down these resources and make digital textbooks. And so if you have an ecosystem that's out there, that's relevant, that people are um, connected with, then there are ways to look at content to make it happen. Or more importantly, a lot of device companies or a lot of major technology companies like devices. You mentioned Bluetooth. A Bluetooth device has to connect to a computer, a tablet or something else. 
I believe there's a unique opportunity to connect with companies who are focused on STEM or education to put together bundles and scenarios to where you package these things together and make it happen. A few years ago, well, yeah, maybe a couple of years back, there was cases out in California where the districts invested a lot of money in, in, in iPads, right? And that program had a couple of issues. But imagine if that they were to have bundled an iPad with a sensor suite that was useful across the entire district, but also relevant to the standards. So I think with some creative packaging and the right partners, there's a way to make it happen and have a win-win everywhere. Very cool. So if someone has a um, a biz, uh, has a school or a private school or home school, mm-hmm. let's say a home school, are these kinds of things inaccessible to them financially? No, they're not. So in particular, in the case of the My STEM Kits business, there actually are two models. And there was one built for homeschools where – um, there's an enterprise model naturally where a school district can go and, you know, subscribe based on the number of kids in a class or a classroom set. But on the consumer side, um, we actually treated it like, um, the models that a lot of the royalty image websites kind of do where our kits have points, whether it's a basic or an extended kit. And there are packages as low as like a couple hundred dollars a year, um, uh, where you can get in kind of get access to the library, print out what you want on demand and be able to get that curriculum. And to your, to your question, um, that also is a part of the business model. We believe that just as we can be effective within schools, that we can also become a resource for home schools, private schools, after school programs and summer schools. Um, I'll give the example of my kids last summer and we had, we were looking for a really full, full summer, full length summer program for um, six-year-olds that focused on STEM. And the most that we could find were these little small one-week stinted programs that they could go to, maybe some a couple of weeks. They were kind of not continuous. But the thing that got me the most about that was I got my kids into a program. They were very excited about it. They were learning STEM-based things. And my kid would come home. My kids would come home at the end of the day, and they were trying to demonstrate to me what they had learned in, in the camp that sum- that day. And when they got home, everything they built was like, um, you know, toilet paper, cardboard with some glue on it with a stick. And by the time they tried to show me the example, it broke. And so all these organizations are out there engaging with our kids and they're using kind of lackluster resources. Um, and I believe that in this My STEM Kids use case, we could become their, their tool set to leverage that gives them sturdy things that are valuable um, to kind of prolong that experience. So that, that again, is uh, something that I'm very excited about. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for talking with me today. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me, man. Anytime we can talk about STEM and the kids, it really excites me. And I, I thank you for lending lending your um, your community and, and your voice to what we're doing. It, it's really much appreciated. Absolutely. And we'll be sure to put links to all the things we talked about in the show notes. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.